and we'll, we'll take one second now and address any questions that you might have about fields or the previewing of the fields. And remember right now we're focusing on tensor, scalar, and directional. So if, if you have any questions about what those are, let's go ahead and drop them into the questions window. All right, so there was a question about what is a tensor. And remember, uh, tensor is, um, in, relative to our fields in Grasshopper, is a vector that is displaying the influence, the directional influence of any charges in the field relative to a point in space, right? So if you were to say that this was a positively charged magnet, and these were all metal filings, right? They would orient in these directions based on that magnet, right? They would shift around, all right? Uh, more generally, a tensor is anything that describes difference between two, th two other things, right? So if, if you're into vectors, which you all be by the end of this webinar, but if you're really into them, um, you may be familiar with cross product and dot product. Let's say the cross product is probably an easier one to start with. Cross product gives you the perpendicular vector from any two vectors. So that is also calculating a tensor. Same with dot product, angle, etc. So these are the tensor vectors from our field. Okay. Um, okay, so let's... Um, take one more th uh, look at one more thing from the previews, right? You'll notice that the tensor objects, right, they don't have an output, and so there's nothing actually coming out of that object. It's just for preview purposes. But the scalar, let's say, scalar object uh, preview does have a result, and it's actually a mesh, right? So this is something that you can actually capture or use uh, beyond the just as a preview object. So let's now talk about how we get stuff from Grasshopper back into Rhino. So if we took this object here, the scalar preview, or the scalar display from the fields, and we right-clicked, if we select it, and right-click on the canvas and say bake, this now creates that object in the, in the, in the Rhino environment, right? And it's now static. So if I move my uh, charge location, right, this now updates, but this does not. Additionally, by default, my viewport was in wireframe. So if I go to shaded, now I can see the shaded preview of that mesh, and that color information is attached to each one of those vertices. So this is super useful, right? Like if you're into ecotech analysis or solar exposure analysis, anything like that, right? This is not too dissimilar from what you're doing there. You're creating a mesh, and you're attaching additional data to each one of the vertices. All right, so if you are in, want to learn more about meshes, there's another webinar coming up that you would be interested in. Um, but for now, we're just going to note we're going to note that these are these two objects here allow us to bake out the preview of what we saw as a mesh into Rhino. Okay, now this is really interesting. Um, but um, Let's take a, uh, one more step, right, which is um, let's look at how we might actually correspond the charge not to the actual mesh color uh, as a preview, but back to the original grid, right? So what we're going to do is I'm going to turn the preview off of my uh, scalar display here. And remember, my point objects are coming out of this output. So one of the other types of um, actions you can do with fields have to do with evaluation, right? So if we go to the evaluate field um, object under vector field, we can actually sample. Remember we said that a field can be sampled at any location. We can sample this field with this set of points. Okay, so what that does is that gives us the scalar, which is the numerical, and the uh, numerical value, and the tensor, which is a vector, at that location. All right, so now we can do stuff with these scalar values, these numbers that correspond to the influence at that location. 
So let's maybe start by, instead of creating a preview of the, um, the scalar influence as a mesh, let's make our own preview, but make it related back to our original cells, right? So let's take these values, these numerical values, which if we drop a panel in, right, we can see that we have numbers here describing the degree of influence in the field. Again, this was evaluate field. All right. Let's take these numbers um, and correspond them to color value. So let's go to the uh, params input gradient object and drop that into the canvas. This allows us to take numerical values and sample them along a linear spectrum of color to return a color corresponding color value. Okay, so what we need to know is the smallest value in our list, the, the largest value in our list, and the current value. And that will then sample uh, your gradient, which I think right off the bat, let's right click and say that we want to choose a different preset. Maybe we do red to blue, this kind of maybe heat map option. Okay, so that makes uh, a new gradient for us. And now we just have to start to work with the numbers. And the way to get the, the lower and upper of our set of values is going to be a mathematical operation. If we go to math, domain, bounds, this allows us to take a number, a collection of numbers, the S output. If we drop this into N and we right click and say flatten because we want only one, we want to know the extremes uh, of all of them, right? So we get one resulting domain. This tells us that our values are in between 0 0.0039 and 10.74. Okay, great. So now all we have to do is say, I need to get those two values, 0 0.0039 and 10.74, onto two outputs. The way we're going to do that is we're going to decompose our domain so we can access the domain components. Again, that's from math domain. We take our domain, connect it there. Our S is L1, our E is start and end, our E is L, L, S is L0, E is L1, and the current values, T, which are the sample locations in between those two values, are gonna come back from S. Okay. So now what that gives us is some color, right, in the format of RGB. So here's our color list of colors, right? And now we've converted our numerical values into color, and we can create a preview in the viewport that corresponds to those colors. So creating a custom preview comes from vector, color, custom preview. And S is going to be my shader or my color. I'm going to connect that to my gradient. And G is going to come back from the grid cells. Okay. Now, I got the outlines to be previewed, but I kind of want it to be more like a fill instead of a stroke. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to temporarily create a planar surface from surface freeform planar surface, and first take my geometry into that, and then preview it. Okay, so here's my setup. This is planar surface. This was my bounds. This is my domain components, which came from math domain. Again, that's from math domain, domain components. This is my gradient object. And this is my custom preview. All right, 
Okay, domain decompose. That is going to be found under math domain, domain components. And that takes in a domain and gives us the lower and upper value for each of, for the collection of values. And that goes into L0 and L1. Okay, so what I got was a mostly red um, collection of uh, triangles. So I'm going to go to my gradient object and I'm going to remove some of my grips by dragging them off the canvas. I'm going to just have to modify them so that I get more of what I'm uh, after. Move my grip lower so that I can try and get a gradient. What's happening is that all my values are really small and then there's just a few that are really big. It's going to be solved here in a second, but I can try and exaggerate this a little bit by doing that. There we go, something like that. Okay, so now I have a, a kind of initial gradient of colored objects based on my charge. And this is interesting, but I think that um, it would be even more interesting if we actually set this up so that we had multiple charge locations. So let's go ahead and let's make a couple more point, look, uh, point objects in Rhino. I'll make three to start. So now I have point, point, and point. I'm going to save this. I'm actually going to save it as another version. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to right-click our charge point. Instead of saying set one, we're going to say set multiple points. Choose those three points, hit OK, and we now need to make one more modification, right? Because we want um, those three charges to create one field, right? We don't want to create a field from this charge, a field from this charge, a field from this charge, but a field that is continuous and incorporates all three of those charges. So the way we do that is under vector field, merge fields, And we're going to drop that in right after the point charge. Notice how this became a list when we gave it a list of point charges. So we're going to take our field, which is three fields, merge them, which gives us one field. And now this can replace any of our field inputs downstream. Okay, got it. All right, so this is going to be a way for us to preview the kind of field at the level of each one of these planar surfaces. And um, it's a little bit more of a, you can get a, a little bit more of a fine understanding of what's happening if you use the actual field um, display objects, like the scalar field, right? This is a, a, a little bit better of a heat map, a little bit easier to understand as you move across the entirety of it as opposed to the planar surfaces, although I like that as an option also. Okay, so this is uh, where we're going to kind of end with uh, the fields of influence. Remember that there are other types of charges you can uh, experiment with, or let's say you could look at um, incorporating a spin force if you were to drop that in the canvas and replace your inputs here. Right, you're going to get a different kind of result from your tensors and your display. Right, so um, we'll encourage you to um, take a look at that um, after the webinar is conclu concluded so we can move on to the next set of exercises. But we will pause here uh, one minute and uh, address any questions you might have. So go ahead and drop them into the, the window, questions window. Okay, um, one question was how can we output the vectors? If we want the vectors to be back into Rhino, that's a great question. Um, can you re-ask it during the next exercise? Because that's what we're going to do next. Are there any other questions? Okay. All right, so let's carry on to the next exercise.
So again, I'll save this and close it. Okay, so this is where we kind of ended. And if you were to use both point charges and uh, spin forces, right, you can get a tensor display that might look something like this.